The U.S. has released its national cybersecurity strategy and developing international norms, calling out bad actors, establishing a credible deterrent, and imposing consequences are important parts of it. The State Department blacklists 33 Russian bad actors. GCHQ is standing up a 4,000-person cyber operations group to counter Russian activity. There's a cryptocurrency heist in Tokyo. Our guest today is Tanya Janka from Microsoft. She shares her OWASP dev slop project. Some senators have seen their Gmail hacked. And we've got some notes on crime and punishment. A few words from our sponsor, Silence. They're the people who protect our own endpoints here at the CyberWire, and you might consider seeing what Silence can do for you. You probably know all about legacy antivirus protection. It's very good as far as it goes, but guess what? The bad guys know all about it, too. It will stop the skids, but to keep the savvier hoods' hands off your endpoints, Silence thinks you need something better. They've just introduced version 2.3 of Silence Optics. It turns every endpoint into its own security operations center. Silence Optics deploys algorithms formed by machine learning to offer not only immediate protection, but security that's quick enough to keep up with the threat by watching, learning, and acting on systems' behavior and resources. Whether you're worried about advanced malware, commodity hacking, or malicious insiders, Silence Optics can help. Visit Silence.com to learn more. And we thank Silence for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, September 21st, 2018. The U.S. has released its national cyber strategy. It puts an emphasis on deterrence, as described by National Security Advisor John Bolton. The strategy has four pillars. Protect the American people, the homeland, and the American way of life. Promote American prosperity, preserve peace through strength, and advance American influence. Each pillar is explained in terms of specific measures. These pillars are those that appear in the larger national strategy. The cyber strategy outlines how cybersecurity, policy, and operations will serve the four pillars. Thus, the strategy is committed to, first, defend the homeland by protecting networks, systems, functions, and data. Second, Promote American prosperity by nurturing a secure, thriving digital economy and fostering strong domestic innovation. Third, preserve peace and security by strengthening the United States' ability, in concert with allies and partners, to deter and, if necessary, punish those who use cyber tools for malicious purposes. And fourth, expand American influence abroad to extend the key tenets of an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure Internet. The pillars are preceded by an introduction offering an answer to the question, how did we get here? That answer calls out, by name, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China, describing them as repressive regimes that exploit open societies and systems while remaining themselves largely and self-consciously closed. Terrorists and criminals are named along with these four adversaries as representing threats to American interests in cyberspace. The introduction says in its discussion of The Way Forward that responding to these threats will be consistent with commitment to an open Internet and, more importantly, to such enduring values as belief in the power of individual liberty, free expression, free markets, and privacy. The priority actions outlined in the third pillar, the Peace Through Strength section of the strategy, are, first, lead with objective collaborative intelligence, that is, objective, actionable intelligence that will lead to clear and credible attribution. Second, the strategy promises to impose consequences that will be swift and transparent and imposed in collaboration with allies. Third, the strategy declares its intention to build a cyber deterrence initiative, also in cooperation with like-minded state committed to emerging international norms. And fourth, the United States will be committed to countering malign cyber influence and information operations, including propaganda and disinformation from both state and non-state actors. Domestically, the strategy has been generally well received by those who've commented on it, notably including experts who worked in the previous administration. They and others see both continuity and evolution toward a clearer, more active policy in cyberspace. 
The strategy has been linked with other official declarations of policy that have been generally regarded as taking the gloves off U.S. Cyber Command and other Department of Defense organizations with respect to offensive cyber operations. In one early example of the sorts of consequences that will be imposed, the U.S. State Department announced that 33 Russian individuals and companies would be blacklisted for what Foggy Bottom characterizes as malign activities. Most are connected with Russian security and intelligence organs. These consequences are to some extent an exercise in making the rubble bounce, since a lot of those sanctioned are already under sanction. But in such matters, there's a serious sense in which it's the thought that counts. Seriously. Over in the United Kingdom, the Ministry of Defense and GCHQ are establishing a 4,000-person unit to protect Great Britain against Russian cyber operations. This can be expected to be one of the partners with whom the U.S. will seek to coordinate deterrence. Tech Bureau Corporation disclosed that roughly $60 million in cryptocurrency had been looted from its Tokyo exchange. The hack occurred over two hours on September 14th, was detected on September 17th, and was confirmed and reported to authorities on the 18th. The company had been under some regulatory pressure to improve security. A new investment round, it says, will help it reimburse those who lost altcoin and help tighten safeguards against theft. Google confirmed yesterday that it had notified some senators that their Gmail accounts and those belonging to their staffers had been targeted by foreign intelligence services. There's been no public attribution of which intelligence services were involved, but the warning has prompted several senators to complain that the Office of the Sergeant-at-Arms has said helping secure personal email accounts, like Gmail accounts, isn't within the scope of its responsibilities. Government accounts, sure. Gmail, no. And finally, two arrests have resulted in two guilty pleas. You may recall a ransomware attack staged through networked Washington, D.C. police traffic cameras shortly before President Trump's inauguration. Romanian national Eveline Sismaru admitted guilt to two of 11 charges she's faced, conspiracy to commit wire fraud and computer fraud. Ms. Sismaru may get a break on her sentence if she follows through on her promise to help investigators against her co-conspirators. And why not? It worked for the guys behind Mirai, after all. The motivation for the hacking was criminal and not, as was widely suspected at the time, political, and the timing of the attack to coincide with the inauguration seems to have been merely coincidental. The hackers may not have even been aware that the devices they compromised were connected to police networks. And in what we might as well call a case of super-duper privacy, since it involves Deadpool, a gentleman took a guilty plea to charges involving his posting the entire Deadpool movie to his Facebook page. In what has become a leitmotif for online acting out, Mr. Trevon Franklin also unwisely tweet-taunted federal law enforcement. Quote, I see all these people taking the feds gone get me. Well, where are they at? End quote. Well, right now they at sentencing recommendation of six months. In plain sight, but not hiding... Mr. Franklin, who was also known in social media by his nom de hack Trayvon M. King, also established a site he called Bootleg Movies. Do crooks today really need remedial instruction in such old-fashioned criminal skills as hiding out, going on the lam, or being D&D instead of a canary? And now a bit about our sponsors at VMware. Their trust network for Workspace ONE can help you secure your enterprise with tested best practices. They've got eight critical capabilities to help you protect, detect, and remediate. A single open platform approach, data loss prevention policies, and contextual policies get you started. They'll help you move on to protecting applications, access management, and encryption. And they'll round out what they can do for you with micro-segmentation and analytics. VMware's white paper on a comprehensive approach to security across the digital workspace will take you through the details and much more. You'll find it at the cyberwire.com slash VMware. See what Workspace One can do for your enterprise security. The cyberwire.com slash VMware. And we thank VMware for sponsoring our show.
And joining me once again is Emily Wilson. She's the Fraud Intelligence Manager at Terbium Labs. Emily, welcome back. Um, We wanted to talk today about this notion of exit scamming, uh, some of the things that you all have been seeing. When it comes to the dark web, what can you share with us? Sure. So glad to be back. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, you know, I've been I've been out of the world for the last few weeks on uh, on this thing they call vacation, which I highly recommend. Mm. Uh, and I came back to find that one of the markets uh, has recently exit scammed. And I thought this was a good idea to talk to uh, you and your listeners about how exit scamming works in the dark web, what it is and and where we see it show up. So in this situation, um, I'll set the scene for you. This is a market that uh, came into play kind of after the alpha bay takedown, kind of in that vacuum that we saw form there. Right. They've always been a little sketchy. You know, they haven't played nicely with others. They actually took down uh, somebody else's site in sort of a big display of power, only to realize that it was going to backfire. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, this is my favorite piece here of a, a little dark web drama, they reached back out to that person they'd gone after and said, hey, are you interested in doing business together? Hmm. Uh, and what the community now thinks is probably an attempt to uh, you know, censor some reporting around the inevitable exit scam. Hmm. And then they disappeared. And that's what an exit scam is. An exit scam is when you know one of these dark web markets just disappears, just goes offline. Mm-hmm. And the reason you do that is because, you know, these are fairly sophisticated platforms. They hold money in escrow for uh, for buyers and sellers. And so if you're looking to make a purchase, you, you know, you pick your listing, you say, I'd like to buy this cocaine, please, or these credit cards. And you, you know, you send your money. Uh, and while they're waiting for the, the transaction to process, the market holds that money in escrow until the seller actually releases the good, right? It's meant to be a, a safety mechanism. So you have a and- sort of a trusted third party that handles the money. So you make sure you get your goods. Exactly. And that, you know, provides a dispute mechanism if something goes wrong, which of course it it inevitably does. Hmm. Uh, Except when, of course, these markets that you quote unquote trust uh, decide to disappear. Uh, And so they run off and they take all of the money held in escrow, which can be quite a large amount of money depending on the market. Um, And and they're gone and you can't do anything about it. You know, they shut down the site, they disappear and there goes all of your money and all of your friends money. And that's what happened here. Is it reasonable to think that this may actually be uh, some of these folks' business plan from the outset to kind of build up this this forum and build trust and, and the ultimate plan is to run off with the money? Absolutely. That's that's definitely – it's it's very lucrative if you do it right. And I'm sure you can imagine, you know, one of the biggest exit scams um, was a market called Evolution that exit scammed back in 2015. And at the time, they ran off with something like – you know, 10 to $15 million worth of Bitcoin. And mm. that was before the Bitcoin price spike. So you can imagine it was particularly attractive this past fall when we saw uh, Bitcoin, you know, spike up in the tens of thousands of dollars. So I guess this is one of those things where if you're doing business in, in unregulated, shady markets, uh, th- this is something you might fall victim to. Absolutely. And it's the sort of thing that everyone knows can happen. You have to choose where you want to place your trust. And when markets go offline briefly, or if you know the connection is shoddy, or if something is not quite right, this is the first thing people think of. They think, oh, they're going to exit scam because everyone's fallen victim to it one or you know, one or more times over the course of their dark web life. Hmm. Um, this was what people thought originally was happening with Alphabet, when Alphabet, who had historically had incredible uptime, you know, this is the market, um, you know, disappeared last July, you know, everyone thought, oh, well, I'm sure it's fine because Alphabet wouldn't do this. You know, they're making enough money. They wouldn't just exit scam. And then over the next couple of days, it, you know, people got increasingly angry thinking like, we trusted you. We built this community together. Did, did you really just do what everyone else does? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it really, it is something people expect, but then, you know, it's very easy for these admins because all they have to do is just walk away. They have the money in their wallet, in their Bitcoin wallet. They can just walk away and really no one can stop them. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess buyer beware, right? Uh, Emily Wilson, thanks for joining us. I'd like to take a minute to tell you about an exciting CyberWire event. It's the fifth annual Women in Cybersecurity Reception. It's taking place October 18th at the International Spy Museum's new facility at L'Enfant Plaza in Washington, D.C., 
The Women in Cybersecurity Reception highlights and celebrates the value and successes of women in the cybersecurity industry. The focus of the event is networking, and it brings together leaders from the private sector, academia, and government from across the region, and women at various points in their careers. The reception also provides a forum for women seeking cybersecurity careers to connect with the technical and business professionals who are shaping the future of our industry. It's not a marketing event, it's just about creating connections. We're grateful to our sponsors. Here are some of them. Our hosting sponsor is Northrop Grumman. Our presenting sponsors are CenturyLink and Silence. Our platinum sponsor is Cooley. Gold sponsors include T. Rowe Price, VMware, Accenture Security, Observit, Saul Ewing, Arnstein and & Lair, and Exelon. The art sponsor this year is Zero Fox. And if your company is interested in supporting this important event, we still have a few sponsorship opportunities available. If you're interested in getting an invitation to this year's event, tell us a little bit about yourself and request one at our website, thecyberwire.com slash WCS. That's thecyberwire.com slash WCS. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope to see you there. My guest today is Tanya Janka. She's a senior cloud advocate for Microsoft, specializing in application security. She's one of the project leaders of the OWASP DevSlop Tool Project, which they describe as a collection of DevOps-driven applications specifically designed to showcase security catastrophes and vulnerabilities for use in security testing, software testing, learning, and teaching for both developers and security professionals. So OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, which is a huge international nonprofit. And our entire goal is to teach about application security. And we're expanding out to cloud security, ops security, all sorts of other things that surround that idea. Almost all of us are volunteers. And basically, we have the Global Foundation, uh, which is not that visible to the public. And then we have chapters, and I run a chapter in Ottawa where you hold meetings and stuff. And then we have projects. And projects include things like Zap, uh, which is um, a web proxy and it's free, and Defect Dojo, which will track all of your vulnerabilities. It's like vulnerability management. And then I met a woman named Nicole Becker from New York City who's amazing. And she said, do you want to start a project with me? I was like, I can't think of anything more fun to do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's one of my professional mentors. She's incredible. And uh, so she created this uh, vulnerable app that had sort of new devops -y types of things. And both of us wanted to learn about DevSecOps. And so uh, I went down to New York and we spent a few days together hacking away at it. And then we presented it at Microsoft Tech Days long before I actually worked for Microsoft. So it has like, broken APIs, like insecure APIs, and we use the mean stack. And we just want to learn new ways to kind of like hack DevOps, if that makes sense. And then we did that workshop a whole bunch of times all over the world together. And then I, I decided to make uh, my own DevOps pipeline to create our website. I'm like, well, why not, you know, eat my own dog food? And if I'm going to make a website or a web app for our project, I'm going to do it with the DevOps pipeline. Cool. So then I started adding security things to it, and I thought I wanted to open source it. But it turns out it's really hard to open source your actual pipeline. Um, mine is an Azure DevOps pipeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out it's really hard to share. Like you can export it in JSON, but because of all the different licenses and stuff, it's just like this huge mess. So I'm like, how can I share it? So I started a video show, um, and it's, I guess, the OWASP DevSlop show and I stream live on Twitch. I'm going to add Mixer and uh, YouTube. Apparently you can stream to all three at the same time. We've had five episodes so far and ba basically um, members of the public can watch myself and a guest quite often. It's someone else from the DevSlot project doing things on my DevOps pipeline as we turn it into a DevSecOps pipeline. So uh, this Sunday we added all sorts of security headers. We're going to add a bunch more till we have all the security headers <laughs> and, <laughs> and we're adding um, a certificate together and then like talking about why you need a certificate, talking about what all the different headers do. And I'm going to have an episode where Simon Bennett comes on and he's the one that created OWASP Zap and we're going to add it to my pipeline. And 
the idea is slowly we're just going to add things to the pipeline and make like little lessons and explain how to do it. And the audience can participate with us. Like they'll say, hey, what about this? Or have you done that? Or this is broken. And whenever I screw something up, they're always helping me, which is really sweet. <laughs> it's like having like several little helpers all the time. It's great. So that is my pretty show. <laughs> yeah. No. But when you say uh, the community, who who are you attracting so far? Who who are your uh, who are your viewers? Who's checking it out? Um. So so far on Twitch, it's a lot of people who are just interested on about cool things on Twitch. Uh, my friend Sue's uh, or Noop Cat. She's um she does super cool IoT types of things. So she'll live code IoT things. Uh, so she'll like live code a thing where if people send her a cute picture of a cat, it'll turn on a light and stuff like that. And mm. just to show people how to code IoT things. So she's been sending her followers to follow me, which is really great. And then members of the OWASP community. And I love the idea of people being able to ask questions and me be able to answer them real time. And sometimes um, on the show, we're going to start interviewing people about things I think are cool. Like someone's going to come on and talk about smart contracts and then how to hack them, which I think is neat. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have different OWASP uh, project leaders come on and then actually implement their project as part of my project, which is like super, super cool. Yeah. So just any... DevSecOps thing that I want to know. I'm just asking cool people to come on the show. And so far, a lot of them are saying yes, which is really neat. And I, I think one of the things that I think is interesting and and, uh, um, and and charming about this is that you're putting yourself out there uh, for folks to watch you in the midst of your learning process. You're not putting yourself in front of them and saying, hey, I'm an expert. Here is my knowledge that I will rain down upon you. Uh, your mistakes are out there, uh, the missteps along the way, uh, and it's really a, a community collaborative process. Yes, as a perfectionist, it's kind of hard to make mistakes in front of other humans. <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm working on being cool about it. Francisca and I, um, she's one of Francisca Bueller. She's one of my project members. And she's also a super anal retentive uh, perfectionist like I am. And so both of us are like comforting each other. Like we tried to implement a certificate on our site three times now. <laughs> Failed three times. Nicole and I, Nicole Becker and I, we wanted to learn about DevSecOps. And she wants to learn about how to break it because she is a red teamer. And I want to learn about the vulnerabilities and then how to defend against them because I am a purple teamer. Um, and then Francisca is a WAF expert. Uh, she writes the core rule set for uh, mod security. She's on that open source team. And so she's been like adding WAFs to pipelines, which is kind of badass. So you can test your new WAF rules and to make sure it doesn't block like real business traffic, which is really neat. And so she's going to add a WAF to our pipeline, which is pretty cool. Now, in terms of, uh, of how this intersects uh, with your work at Microsoft, or are they supportive of your efforts here? Is this a, is this a side project you're doing off the clock? How much are they involved? Um, so they've given me unlimited Azure resources, which is really amazing. Hmm. And I don't only have to show Microsoft products, which is really cool. Um, so basically, they've given us like free server space, and basically, like I have security sensor and all this monitoring and all of it's free because I work for them, which is really, really cool. Um, so they're being super, super ridiculously supportive. Our thanks to Tanya Janka for joining us today. We only had time here for a small part of our conversation. We discussed her thoughts on being a woman in tech, the fearlessness she learned from a previous career as a professional musician, the importance of mentoring, and much more. We posted the full extended version of our conversation over on our CyberWire Patreon page. There's a link in today's show notes, and we hope you'll check it out. You don't need to be a Patreon contributor to listen, but while you're there, we hope you'll check out all the ways you can help support our show. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silence.com. And Silence is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the CyberWire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. 
Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Iben, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.